Okay, so a little different from how I ordinarily do it, but um, because this week is so odd, we had, of course, Monday off, and then we do not have class Friday due to Shadron State's presidential inauguration. I figured I just pre-record my um, Wednesday lecture and post that on Canvas. So this, um, this lecture, I would like to introduce polar coordinates. Um, sorry there is no video, by the way. I don't know if it bothers uh, people. There, um, there is a video camera in this room, and I have just never been able to make it work. Um, so you'll have to do without my smiling face. Um, polar coordinates are a way of graphing wait. And polar coordinates have their work cut out for them in the sense that we already have a way of graphing points, and that is the standard Cartesian plane with an x axis and a y axis. And we have points like four comma two. The four is an X coordinate, the two is a Y coordinate. So we go one, two, three, four, one, two, there's our point. So the way, the reason I say that polar coordinates have their work cut out for them is, well, we already have this way of graphing. Polar coordinates had better be able to do something that these familiar rectangular coordinates can't do. And polar coordinates can do stuff that you cannot do with rectangular coordinates. We'll talk about that down the line, but for today, we should just broadly answer the question, what are polar coordinates? So, let's draw the Cartesian plane. We'll still draw at Axes, even though we're not going to use them in the same way that we did with rectangular coordinates. And let's say we have a point on the Cartesian plane, and we want to represent this point. We want to give numbers that tell you where this point is. Again, we've seen many times by now in our mathematical career, we've seen a way of doing this, which is to measure this distance and to measure this distance and then list those distances, x comma y. Here is the thought behind polar coordinates. Let's create an angle. Using the origin as our vertex and the x-axis as our initial side, so we have an angle in the standard position Let's draw the terminal side so that it passes through the point.
And let's measure that angle theta. And now, instead of a horizontal distance x and a vertical distance r, y, sorry, we'll measure the distance along that terminal side, the distance between the origin and the point, and we'll call it r. This r and this theta determine that point. They tell you where a point is. So this, or these, I guess I should say, are polar coordinates. We use R even though we don't really have a circle, we call R the radius, which is why the letter R is being used here. So, say we have the point um, four comma pi over four. And it's unfortunate that um that rectangular coordinates and polar coordinates look exactly the same. They're both number, comma, number. But let's say we have this point, then it's a point in polar coordinates. So this four is a radius. This theta is an angle. And let's try to find this point. So, We're not actually going to need those, but I'm putting them in for reference. We'll start with the angle. Um, pi over four is 45 degrees. Here, is a 45 degree angle. And now we'll take that line segment and we'll go four units up it, or four units along it. So here's where I try to measure as best I can. That should be about one unit. That should be about two units. This should be about three units. And that should be about four units. So that point there is the point four comma pi divided by four. Let's do a few other examples. Let's look at a bigger angle. Let's look at, you will know, change the radius just for variety, five comma, um, seven pi divided by six. Okay, so you see the reason I draw the 
the Cartesian plane, even though polar coordinates don't use the x-axis and the y-axis, but what polar coordinates do use is the origin as the vertex of the angle, and then the x-axis as the initial side of the angle. So seven pi over six is a little bigger than six pi over six, which is pi 180 degrees. So around there, maybe a little smaller, but I've never claimed to be much of an artist. And now we need to go a distance of five units along that line. And you know, another nice thing about having the X and the Y axis is that they give us some idea of what a distance of five should look like. So one is about there, two about there, three about there, four about there, five about there. And here is the point five comma seven pi over six. Now, I'm going to tell you a weird fact about polar coordinates, or maybe you won't think it's that weird, but this R, I've described it as a distance, which you can see on in this picture. It's a distance of one unit, two units, three units, four units, five units. It's called the radius. And a distance you'd think would have to be positive. And the radius of a circle has to be positive. But R in polar coordinates does not have to be positive. You can have something like negative three comma pi divided by four. So let's take a look at this and answer the question, what does it mean to have a negative radius. I will again quickly sketch in the x and the y axis. And I'll put checks along them so we have some sense of scale. And now let's find this point. So we'll start with pi over four. That is to say, we'll use this part of the x-axis as the initial side of an angle. And then we'll create an angle of pi over four radians. I may say, incidentally, that I have never seen polar coordinates used with degrees. It's always radians. And now we have negative three. So what that's going to do, I'm going to take this line I've drawn, this terminal side of the angle, And I'm going to extend it in the opposite direction. And instead of counting three units up the terminal side, like so, 
We are now going to count three units along this extended line in the opposite direction. So making allowances for my artistry, the point negative three comma pi divided by four should be about there. So one last comment before I end this video, even though I'm thinking of this as my Wednesday lecture, I'll still chop these videos up into bite-sized pieces. In rectangular coordinates, There is only one way to write any point. So we have the x coordinate and the y coordinate. And we have a point that we're interested in. And to write this point using rectangular coordinates, we find this distance, maybe five. This distance could be about some, something between one and two. Let's call it 1.5. And that gives us the point 5, comma, 1.5. By contrast, in the polar coordinates, Any point can be written an infinite number of ways. And the, well, there are two reasons for this. Um, the fact that the radius can be negative and the fact that two different angles can be a co-terminal. So let's look at the point, um, I comma two. Uh, sorry, I sometimes make that mistake. Two comma pi radius then angle. So, starting with the positive part of the x-axis as our initial side, the terminal side is going to be a here. Um, for us to have an angle, of pi radians, and we go one unit, two units, and there's the point two comma pi. Well, 
Well, it's also the point two comma three pi. Let's investigate that thing. We start here. This is our initial side. Here's pi radians. Here's two pi radians. Here is three pi radians. So three pi and pi are co-terminal. That is to say, the terminal side of these two angles is in the same place. So, we draw the terminal side of three pi radians. It's here. And we go one unit, two units along the terminal side. And we wind up at the exact same face we wound up with when we graphed two comma i. Um, this is also, for example, The point two, I'm um, sorry, negative two, comma, two pi. And again, let's think this through. That's my attempt to very delicately erase failed. Let me draw that back in. And let's find two pi. And I say that, but I hope at this point in a trigonometry class, you just know there are two pi radians in a circle. So here's our initial side. We go two pi radians around. And here is our terminal side. So there's our terminal side. It starts at the origin and points to the right. And one day I will stop accidentally erasing stuff, but not today. What does that negative in front of the two mean? Well, it means that instead of going to the right, instead of going up the terminal side, we should extend the terminal side in the other direction. And we should go one unit, two units in the opposite direction from the initial side. And again, we wind up in precisely the same place. So polar coordinates have their oddities. Um, at the same time, polar coordinates are really good at some stuff that rectangular coordinates are not good at. I mean, it probably seems at this point in the lecture that we're reinventing the re wheel, but also that we're doing an extremely bad job of reinventing the wheel, that we're making stuff much more complicated for no reason. 
But once we really get into graphing, we'll see the power of polar coordinates. And I just want to end this video, um, not the entire lecture, we still have time remaining, but I just want to end this video looking at a quick graph of a polar equation on Desmos. So, um, when you're graphing with polar coordinates, and we'll talk about this more later, um, but the radius, the r is going to be your dependent variable, and theta is going to be your independent variable. So let me just give two quick examples of the power of polar coordinates. We'll start by drawing a circle. Now, we can draw circles using rectangular coordinates, but I don't think anybody would like to say that this is a nice equation. Um, drawing this exact same circle using a polar coordinates, it's going to take three key presses. Exact same equation, much simpler. So polar coordinates tend to get used when we have circular motion. They get used a lot in astronomy, for example, when you have, well, not literally circular, but elliptical motion of planets around the sun. Um, here's another equation that is very easy to write using polar coordinates but which would be an indescribable nightmare to try to write down using rectangular coordinates. R equals theta gives us a lovely spiral. And there is no way to write this spiral using rectangular coordinates. Or if there is, it would be such an amazing hassle that it would never be worth it. If you're going to be um, modeling spirals, if they're going to be modeling circles, Polar coordinates really are the way to go. They may seem like a hassle. They may seem harder to work with than the rectangular coordinates. They may have these weird quirks that rectangular coordinates don't have. But polar coordinates, when used properly, are extremely powerful. So with that hopeful uh, reassurance that we're not wasting your time, that this really is good for something, I will end this video.